Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Southern Four Wheel Drive Association's TechNet. On these TechNets, we provide you with the straight, direct tech from the very best and the biggest brands in the industry. Tonight, we're going to hear directly from Jeremy Ayers, uh, Nitro Gear and Axle. You know, we give away a prize every week, the previous week's lucky winner was Rick Darnell from Hamilton, Ohio. Uh, Rick's a member of the Ohio River Four Wheelers. And he gets a certificate from RCB Performance for $250. A certificate is going to be good for almost any, any of the RCB products. We're going to be giving away a prize this week also. Let me, uh, let me see if I can find it here. We're going to be giving away a Carhartt backpack. This is, this is really a neat backpack. So let's go ahead and bring Mike uh, and Mike's wife, Sarah on screen and they're going to talk to us about how to win that backpack and then talk about a little bit about Morrison Outdoor Adventures. How are we doing? I hope um, everyone had an awesome uh, 4th of July that you were able to uh, enjoy it with friends and family as best as you can. It's being responsible, socially distancing as best as you can. Um, we went uh, and spent some time with Sarah's family down at the beach um, and tonight I do have my wonderful wife, Sarah, with me, uh, sitting here. She's going to fill us in a little bit more about Morrison's Outdoor Adventures and what we do. Hey, guys. Um, thanks for having me tonight. So Mike and I run Mor Morrison's Outdoor Adventures, also known as MOA sometimes. Um, so what our mission is, is to reconnect family and individuals with the outdoors and through the outdoors. Um, so we offer a couple of different things. We offer guided trail rides, um, guided trips, off-road driver training, vehicle recovery classes, and more. So next Wednesday, we have our first ever um, off-road essentials with Mike, 7 to 9 at Asheville Vehicle Outfitter Shop. And the topic next Wednesday is recovery, intro to recovery. Um, and then we also have a trail ride coming up next weekend with Asheville Vehicle um, Outfitters up at Winrock, and it's for advanced drivers. So you can find out more information on our Facebook page, our website, and our Instagram. So make sure you check that out and let us know if you have any questions. Awesome. <laughs> All right, guys. So um, TechNet, we're going to be talking about gears tonight, differentials. Uh, we've got Jeremy Ayers from Nitro Gear and Axle here. Uh, but before we get into that, let's kind of go over some bases for how this is going to work for those of you that are new and a refresher for those that aren't. But let's go ahead and have you guys post your questions that you have in the comments. Pre preface it with a cue so that we know that it's a question. And when we get done and get to the end of uh, the Q&A or we get in to the end of the presentation with Jeremy, We'll ask him those questions. So go ahead and post them up in the comments down there. We'll go back and make sure we ask those. Also, in order to win the Carhartt backpack, right? Pretty cool backpack. Maybe it's a good way to carry some gear on the trail, some recovery gear, or even it's a good way to kind of pack a day pack for when you're on the trail so you have all your safety stuff with you. But in order to win that, give us your name, the vehicle you drive, and where you're from. So mine would be Mike Morrison, drive a 2019 Dodge Ram, and uh, I'm currently from Marion, North Carolina. So post that into the comments for a chance to win that Carhartt backpack, and at the next TetNet, you could be the winner. All right, so without going any further um, and dragging this out any further, let's go ahead and bring Jeremy on and get started learning about gears. Hey, Jeremy, how's it going? Good. How are you? Thanks for having us. I've got my wife, yeah. Shauna, here with us. Excellent. Excellent. It's great to have you guys here. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I have uh, been in the differential world now for oh, 25 plus years, and I started my own company about 15 years ago. Uh, prior to that, I actually worked for one of my co competitors now. Um, we, we actually still have a, a good relationship to these, to these days though. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit about, uh, nitro gears and axle. 
Well, so um, the corporation is actually JT's Parts and Accessories, and Nitro Gear and Axle is our brand. Um, under that brand, you've got traction devices, be it limited slips and lockers, master install kits, spools, front axle shafts, rear axle shafts, ring and pinions, basically anything that goes in, on, or around a differential on a rear-wheel drive or four-wheel drive vehicle. Wow. Wow, that's got to be quite a parts list to keep up with. It is. It's in a lot of small parts as well. So it's it, it's uh, it's difficult keeping all the parts on hand, but that's that's one of the things we kind of pride ourselves on. Wow, that's awesome. So you guys offer everything to rebuild differentials, to re-gear differentials, axle shafts, all that stuff. Correct. And, and we're shipping parts worldwide, too. So not just in the States. We uh, we do a lot of business in Australia, Russia, Canada, a little bit in Mexico. We've got some really good customers in Chile, um, Sweden as well. Um, boy, UAE, we've got some really good customers over there. Canada. Yep. All over the world. Yeah, where they get all the cooler vehicles than we get here, the Hiluxes mm -hmm. and Land Cruisers and all the diesel trucks. Yeah. yeah. That, that's My business awesome. partner actually has a uh, a right-hand drive Troopy that's uh, like a pop-top, kind of like one of the Volkswagen Vanigans. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. yeah when I used to do four-wheel drive training with the military, we trained on a lot of uh, Toyota Land Cruisers and Hiluxes and Troopies and things like that. Yeah, I love yeah. those vehicles. Yeah, I wish we got well, more of them here. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. All right, so, well, tonight, basically, a lot of who we've got here is a lot of kind of beginners. Um, we do have kind of some people that have been in the four-wheel drive industry for a while, but biggest thing would be to kind of get them to understand a little bit more about the differential. Um, I used to have a trainer that I trained with, and when he would explain it to people, he'd always say there's a lot of magic that happens in there. And people just kind of accept that uh, because it's hard to kind of wrap your head around what's going on inside of a differential. So how about we kind of start there a little bit? I mean, I guess a, a lot of it is really going back to basics and determining whether or not you need to re-gear. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that you know they lifted their vehicle they put a three and a half inch lift and they put 35s and they think well i don't need to re-gear you know it, it, it the jeep drives just fine well what they don't realize though is it is wanting to shift a lot more frequently it's not going to want to hold the gears and it's just not working like the way it was designed from the factory you know so i mean if, if you've gone up three four inches in a tire size i mean your vehicle automatically needs re-geared you know otherwise it's it's just working harder than it needs to you have anything you yeah. want to add to that or well i mean jeremy could nerd out all day and tell you every little piece that goes in the differential and the power comes in from the drive shaft and it goes through the pinion and it goes through the ring gear and then it goes here and and then it spins the axle shafts but i think what's really important for beginners to realize is um how important axle ratios and maintaining your differentials is to your vehicle everybody wants to spend money on flashy you know we all want to do it we all want to put fenders on and we want to put bumpers on and we want to get a new soft top and uh stickers but it's hard for us to justify spending the money on axle parts and i think it's one of the things that um is really important to me and to jeremy is um, educating the new Jeep owner on what differentials are, how they work, and why it's important to change your gear ratio. And I have been really dedicated um, since I started working for this company about four years ago um, in really bringing women into the mechanical side and the off-roading side. Um, and just trying to empower women all throughout off-roading and, well, not even just off-road, but motorsports in general. So, That's awesome. Yeah, there's some really important things for people to understand. One thing, one big misconception, like Mythbusters edition that I want to run by you is a lot of people say, well, I don't need to re-gear. I'm not going to off-road. Um, that's really common. I hear that every day. Um, gears are not for off-roading. 
re-gearing is just to put your vehicle back to stock performance and back in its power band, or depending on the ratio you choose, give it a little more power. And um, they assume there's another big misconception that a, a stock gear ratio that your vehicle came with, that that ring and pinion is smaller than the aftermarket ones. A lot of people say, well, when that one breaks, I'll change it. Well, that's actually, they're the same size. They're just a different tooth on the pinion and tooth to the ring gear. The ratio is different. So it, it enables things to turn at a different rate. So those are two big misconceptions that sometimes I say to him, I'm like, well, people think that this gear is bigger or stronger. And he's like, people don't think that. I'm like, yeah, they do. It's been a long time since he's been a beginner. <laughs> That's certainly something that uh, that we don't think about often, having been in the industry for a long time. Um, so when someone is looking to re-gear their vehicle, how should they kind of go about choosing the correct gear ratio? You know, you jump on a forum and the arguments are always, ah, 488s or 529s or 410s and 355s. But there there is actually a a more scientific way to get to that point, correct? Yeah, I mean... A lot of that is talking to the right person that's going to ask the proper question. So, you know, we always recommend that, yeah, you know, social media is a good place to ask these questions. But sometimes people just suggest, well, I have 488s in mine and I have the same size tire. So that's what you need. Well, what they're not coming considering, though, is, well, is his a manual and mine's an automatic and I live in Florida versus this other guy lives in Colorado. So. You know, things like Florida being flat and Colorado being so hilly, that's a good question that our sales guys will ask people to determine what terrain they're driving on. Is it an automatic or manual? And things like, do you tow? Um, do, have you added a bunch of weight, like a winch, maybe a rooftop tent? So there's a lot of factors that go into, we can't just say, well, all JKs with 35s need a 488 because it's just simply not true. You know, so by asking these questions, though, we can we can make a better determination on does he need a four, five, six or does he really need a five thirteen? Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of different factors that play in. And so that kind of makes it different for everyone. Um, so you Correct. can't really go off of, you know, my friend Bobby just lifted his and put thirty fives and he's got four eighty eights. I do the same thing, but I may have, you know, a rooftop tent and I carry around six kids and two dogs and everything else. So that can make a huge difference. A That's huge an awesome way to... In JK specifically, I'm sure you guys have a lot of JK viewers and I'm a JK owner. How I have been for the last four years. Uh, a lot of people don't always realize that the JK came with two different power plants, or even if they do know that, that one came with a three, six and one came with a three, eight. The thing they don't realize is that the three, six came with like a i believe it's a five speed so now i want a five speed yes. a five speed automatic whereas the 3.8 came with a four speed automatic behind it so this two completely different drive trains two completely different engines two completely different transmissions and completely different amount of gears and the ratio on each gear is different so just because your friend has 513s on his 07 jk with 35s doesn't mean you need them for your 2015 jk on 35s yeah most definitely so that can make a huge difference huge difference and the and same, thing, hold, this same thing holds true you know for all vehicles whether it's a a jeep or a toyota tacoma or a, a chevy colorado you know by asking the right questions we can we can determine the proper ratio excellent so once we take someone and they've kind of chosen their their gear ratio, there are options out there about different types of gears that you can read about. You know, people say, well, cryo treat it's better, heat treat it's better, different things like that as far as how strong the gear sets are. Is there really any merit to that? Well, there are different materials that gears can be made out of. But as far as the cryogenics, honestly, we don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, at one point in time, it seemed like it was kind of a bigger fad than it is now. Um, we were actually seeing customers would cryo their gears and then send them to us for setup, but those gears were failing at a higher rate than than non non cryogenic treated gears. So, but I mean, really, that's about the extent of the experience I have with that. I mean, 
the difference between a good versus a bad ring and pinion really is is how well does it set up? Because a good ring and pinion should set up with shims that are close to factory. And then when you're done, you've established a good tooth, tooth contact pattern and you have a quiet gear. You know, so oftentimes it's not really a case of strength. It's it's set up and whether it's quiet or noisy. Excellent. Yeah, that's that's a good thing to kind of point out um, with with that, uh, because when you read on a forum, there's always people on there again, social media, things like that. Oh, you got to have cryo cryo treated gears and things like that. So it's good to hear from someone in the industry with a little bit more experience than than the rest of us. So another professional did some testing, right? There's lots. There's been some independent testing out there where uh, results haven't really been promising. You know, to say that one's stronger than the other. I think it depends on the part, though, too. And and usage. Yeah. Yeah. And so once you get a set of gears put in, you know, it's not just putting a ring and pinion in there. When you go into a differential and you install it, you've got to pretty much go through and if it's an older vehicle, most definitely rebuild a lot of the internals of the differential, correct? Yeah. Um, So, you know, when putting in a new ring and pinion, I always say it's best to get the master install kit with it because that way you're getting four new bearings. And a lot of times if somebody tries to reuse a bearing, they'll damage it when when trying to remove it, right? They'll pull the cage up and all the rollers will fall out everywhere. So if you get a new master install kit, it's kind of like an insurance policy, right? You get You get your bearings and you get all the shims so that you can adjust your depth, your preload, your backlash. You're also going to get, you know, like a new crush sleeve. You're going to get the seal, the pinion nut. So, you know, these are all parts, though, that you can't really run down to your local AutoZone or Advanced Auto Parts and get. You know, that's why it's easier just to get the kit when you get the gears. It's, uh, yeah, one one part number and you got everything you need. Um, It just it's going to save you headache and, and probably money in the long run, you know. Yeah, once you've been into a differential once, you don't really want to go back a couple of days later. Yeah, that's for sure. So, I mean, the the biggest thing really when setting up gears is it does take a lot of patience because there are times, you know, that you may have the ring gear and carrier out uh, five, six different times, as well as the pinion if you have to change the depth shim. So, you know, I mean, it, it's it's assembly and disassembly over and over to get it perfect, right? Definitely, no. definitely. Well, so some of those terms that you brought up that some people may not be familiar with, like backlash. So what, what is backlash in the differential? The backlash is the amount of play between the ring gear and the pinion. So we would use a dial indicator. Um, I wish I had one to show you. They've got like a little spring-loaded plunger on them, and then they sit on a magnetic base. And so typically you'd magnetize that base to the flat surface where your diff cover bolts up. And then the uh, the plunger is going to go on one of your ring gear teeth. And then I typically just put a wrench on one of the ring gear bolts and I'm going to walk it back and forth. And I'm going to watch that indicator. Um, on a new set of gears, you're looking at like six to 10 thousandths of backlash. So um, yeah. backlash can be set with side adjusters, like say Toyota or Ford 9-inch where they're a threaded adjuster and it moves that ring gear in a side to side fashion, or it can be shims, you know, and, and you're accomplishing the same thing, just a different method of, of adjusting that ring gear in a side to side fashion. Excellent. That's probably one of the best uh, explanations of backlash I've ever heard. So that's, that's perfect. Now, so you, you kind of adjust that side to side. What about, yeah, yeah. So that's, so what about pinion depth? Tell us a little so bit about pinion that. Pinion depth is is when we're moving the, the pinion in a front to rear fashion, right? So, um, you know, we're either going to move that pinion towards the front of the vehicle or towards the back of the vehicle. But that shim can go one of two places. It can either go underneath the bearing or it can go underneath the race. So, you know, changing pinion depth is, is not really an easy task when you have to adjust it. Um, that's one of the things I keep kind of coming back to how well does your gear set up? Because if it sets up with a factory shim, it's a big time saver, especially for the shop that's trying to make money on labor, right? 
So the quicker we can have the job done, the more money that shop makes. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, uh, bearing preload. You mentioned okay. that earlier. So we've got four bearings in there. We've got our two on the pinion. And the closer we bring those two bearings together, the more preload. As we put space between the bearings and bring them apart is less preload. So there's, pending on the axle, some axles use a crush collar or a collapsible spacer. Uh, some axles, a lot of the Dana axles just have a step on the pinion, and then you've got a real small shim that does your adjustment. And then also we have solid spacers to eliminate crush sleeves too. Um, all three of these methods, all they're doing is is changing the distance between those two bearings on the pinion shaft. So, like I say, as we bring the bearings closer together, it's more preload, and as we spread them apart, it's less preload. Um, and then you've also got preload on your carrier bearings. Now, that is a, the more the merrier. You can't really measure it like you would with pinion bearings. You'd measure the preload with an inch-pound torque wrench. Uh, carrier bearings, there is no real way to measure those. But because it's not two bearings you're preloading, you basically want all the preload you can possibly get on your carrier bearings. Excellent. Excellent. So if that affects really affects the longevity of your bearings and your and your setup, correct? If you have incorrect preload on like say your pinion bearings. Yes. If you let's say you over preload those bearings, what you'll find is that you're going to end up burning those pinion bearings up uh, prematurely. You know, they're just not going to last if you put too much preload. And the same can be said if your preload's loose. Like, let's say it was a crush sleeve and you didn't collapse it all the way. Well, then your pinion would actually have movement. And, you know, if you have movement in those bearings, same thing. They're going to wear prematurely. So, you know... um, we actually, Ricky from RCV just came over this past weekend and we set up the axle on his and it was kind of a big learning experience for Ricky too, because, you know, here I am breaking out an inch pound torque wrench, which has a, a big needle on it, right? It's not like we're torquing a fastener. We're actually measuring rolling resistance. Uh, so, you know, having the proper tools is, is another big thing because a lot of people don't have one of those specialty inch pound torque wrenches. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I know in the past, um, I've browsed browsed through your guys' website. You guys offer a lot of those tools, don't you? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. They're the the tools are actually kind of becoming more and more popular. They're they're starting to actually sell very well. Yeah, a lot of people are starting to want to do a lot more themselves. You know, with the onset of tutorial videos on YouTube and things like that. So that's awesome that they have access to those tools without trying to flag down a snap-on truck or something like that. Right. Um, so that's super cool. And we do All have right, some videos so- to help people with DIY that's jobs. That's so awesome. I, on our YouTube channel, there is some minor how-to videos, not a lot of major ones right now. Um, I usually, well, people will ask me, should I install my own gears? And if you have to ask, the answer is no. <laughs> kind of, if you know you're fit for the job, you know you're fit for the job. But for the most part, most people are going to be taking their vehicles to a shop to be re-geared. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that is a really in-depth process and it does have to be right. So if but there's simple, like things, we're talking about, yeah. simple things like changing your gear oil or installing a nitro diff cover, we have videos on our YouTube to uh, walk you through that process of installing a diff cover or changing your own differential fluid, because those are important things. I think most <laughs> off-road enthusiasts, they need to know how to do. Awesome. Yeah, I think that is great, great stuff. And I think um, that actually, so once you get your gears and stuff set up, you know, there's there's a lot of people that kind of talk about synthetic versus conventional oil and the differentials and things like that. At what point in time should you really start looking at what type of oil you put in your differential? We we actually, our, our own nitro oil is actually a synthetic blend. So it's not a full synthetic. It's a uh... It's a para parasin is what they call it. So it's it's actually got mineral oils and synthetics in it, both. Um, you know, most manufacturers these days do recommend a synthetic, but you know, as far as break in, like that first five hundred miles, we recommend just putting in a standard mineral oil is actually better for the break in 
And then after you do your 500 mile gear change, then put in the nicer, more expensive nitro oil or, or whatever royal purple AMS oil, you know, a good quality oil. Yeah. So you're not just draining it out right away. Yep. So we've got the oil in the differential. It's been regeared. We've gone through that process. Talk a little bit about the break-in period and why that's so important and kind of how should we go through that break-in period? Yeah, break-in is something that I preach really hard to not only the shops that purchase from us, but also the direct consumer especially. Because as a manufacturer, I cannot always count that the shop is going to have the time to educate the customer on how to break in their gears. So I do try to get a lot of education out there about that. And basically, once you've picked your vehicle up, you're going to drive it 10 to 20 minutes and then pull over and let it cool down. So drive it to the store, grab a soda, let it cool down. You can actually feel the differential. It'll get hot. And then you let it cool down for about the same amount of time and then continue on. And you want to do a few heat cycles. These are called heat cycles. So it allows the gears to warm up and then cool down and then warm up and then cool down. Um, there's a phosphorus coating on any nitro gear that you buy. And this coating keeps the gears from getting rusty and it, and it ensures that you're getting a good quality gear. But a lot of that wears off as you break it in. So you're, you're basically, you're taking these two gears and they're learning how to mesh with each other. And I use this in our, in our uh, shop all the time. You know, when we get new employees, they have to learn how to mesh too, just like a ring and pinion. So while this ring and pinion is becoming like a married set, um, it's going to create some friction. There's going to be some heat. And so you do these heat cycles and you do about five heat cycles. And then um, after your heat cycles are done, then you can drive your vehicle like normal. Um, and you just break those gears in over 500 miles of normal driving. When you drain that fluid, you are going to see a few little metal flakes. If you see any big chunks, that's cause for concern. If the differential is making a lot of noise, that's cause for concern. If you just see some speckles, um, that's fine. And so then you drain your oil all the way out. You let it completely drain and then you fill it up with a fresh oil to get rid of any contaminants that might be in the oil or any phosphorus or any metal shavings. And then after that, you are go wild. That's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've heard horror stories of people, you know, they get a new set of gears in, they go out, they don't go through the break-in period and their differential fails in some way, shape or form. And always the first question that's asked is, well, did you do the break-in period? The what? I, I didn't know about that, you know, and, and then they're kind of back at square one again. So that's a little bit of uh, good information to kind of know about going through that. And I didn't know about the phosphorus coating on there. That's awesome. Yeah, the black coating. Yep. That is not necessarily exclusive to Nitro Gear. I mean, our formula is obviously exclusive, but um, a lot of companies do a coating, but there are lots of companies that don't. So sometimes you'll get a gear that has some some rust on it or or other things that have to be cleaned up and this is another reason uh why a man, why a shop would choose a nitro gear because it is phosphorus coated they don't have to worry about cleaning the gear up before it goes in when they receive it from us it's ready to go it's ready to go in the vehicle excellent excellent one of uh the questions that i get asked a lot as as a trainer in the kind of the four-wheel drive world there's always that concern that once you get to too high numerically of a gear ratio that you start to actually weaken the, the ring and pinion gear because of the number of teeth on there. Is there any merit to that? I actually have a really good answer for this one. And usually this these kind of questions would go to Jeremy, but I just did a tech video, um, I don't know, about eight months to a year ago on this very topic. So I do hear that a lot. They are concerned that if you get up to like a 513 in a Dana 30, that the pinion is too small or that the teeth, the teeth are, are too small. And that, um, if you want to check it out, like I said, there's a video on our YouTube of this very topic, but that just simply isn't the case. This, um, myth we'll call it has its roots in old school, very small ring and pinions. Um, and that is where this kind of came from. But as a manufacturer, I would never manufacture and sell a gear that's going to fail. 
it doesn't make any sense for me to continue to make a gear that's going to fail. So it doesn't matter if you're 456, 488, or 513, especially in a JK platform. Um, you're not sacrificing any strength there in those ring and pinions. And it, there may be a slight difference in the pinion shaft size um, or the pinion head, but it's not enough for it to cause any weakening. And it's just a, I, I don't know how to, else to say it's just an old wives tale. It's just an old myth. Kind of like a, how everyone who owns a Jeep believes that it has seven slots in the grill because it was the first vehicle on all seven continents. You know, a lot of us know that's not true, but it's an old story that we've been told since we bought the thing and we just think it to be true. So that's kind of how that myth goes. And it just, there is no other way to say it. If they, if they broke every time people installed them, we wouldn't sell them. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Um, that's perfect. So when, so we've gone through, we've kind of rebuilt our gears. We've chosen our gear set or re-geared the vehicle. So we've kind of gone through that process. Let's talk a little bit about kind of differential repair a little bit, because a differential is a wearable item in a vehicle. It is something that you have to take care of. And it's in, in kind of the four-wheel drive training world, for us, that's kind of the one thing that you can't do like a field expedient fix in the field. So there's some things that you want to check and do with the differential kind of on routine maintenance, correct? Yeah, I would say that, you know, if you're under your vehicle, let's say you're greasing zerks or something, it wouldn't be a bad idea to just grab hold of that pinion and give it a spin and also give it give it a tug up and down just to make sure that there isn't any movement. Um, so things like that. But then also the other quick check would be to like pop the fill plug out and stick your finger in there and A, check checking two things. Is the differential have enough fluid in it? But also what does it look like? Does it, maybe I went through a water crossing you know, last time I was out wheeling and, you know, I, I got water in the diff, but I didn't realize it. So, you know, just putting your finger in there can tell you a lot. Yeah. If it comes out milky, yeah, (laughs) if it comes out milky, right, it's got some water in there or something along those lines. That's perfect. Um, so what about like carrier bearings and things like that? Is there really anything, um, as far as replacing those, like say, 80,000 miles, 100,000 miles, things like that? Or is it more just a how rough you are on your vehicle and how they've worn? Well, I mean, with with bearings are the biggest wear item in there. The ring and pinion, I mean, yes, it wears, but it's not a wear item like a bearing would be. Um, Bearings, like I say, if the preload was set properly, they're going to last for thousands and thousands of miles, depending on, A, that you didn't have a leak and lose fluid you know, that it's still got fluid in it, and B, that you didn't ever overheat it. Um, about the only time you're going to overheat it is like with a brand new gear set. She was talking about break-in earlier, and, you know, like, let's say your truck came with 342s. You brought it over to JT's to have it re-geared, and we did 430 gears in it. Well, if you took off with your boat, towing across a pass like a four-hour long drive, well, you would essentially you would burn your gears up because what would happen is it starts building that heat and it just continuously builds and builds and builds. And eventually that gear oil breaks down and it can no longer lubricate the bearing. So, you know, heat, heat is a big one, but only with a new ring and pinion, right? Yeah. 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 Most definitely. Um, we actually, in our field expedient repair kits that we used to teach with the military training, we carried infrared thermometers, so that these guys could shoot differentials and things like that to see how hot they were getting going over the up, the passes in up armored vehicles and things like that, because um, they were actually having problems in the Hiluxes with the uh, with the differentials. Yep, yep. Uh, I'm just curious when when you guys were checking those military trucks, what kind of temperatures were you seeing? Do you recall? I don't. I don't off the top of my head. We just taught using the infrared thermometer to check for temperature disparities between the between the differentials. Right. I know there are sometimes like with new ring and pinions where, let's say it's got a thin like a stamped steel factory diff cover, and you can go put your hand on it. You can't even hold your hand on it. You know. So that kind of gives you an idea of of how hot it can get. Yeah. Yeah. So. Kind of talking about maintenance, but let's say, you know, I walk outside my Jeep TJ and I find, uh, 
you know, a couple of spots on, on the up underneath the differential of oil. So replacing a diff cover, you know, that's something that someone could easily do with relatively low mechanical knowledge, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And replacing the diff cover is going to add lots of things. Um, one, many differentials don't even have a drain plug on them, right? So in order to drain the fluid, you got to loosen all the bolts and smack it with a dead blow or something. And, you know, it all comes leaking out of the pan. But like with the nitro covers, we include a drain plug in them, which is kind of a nice feature. But the other thing is they're made out of aluminum. And so they're really thick. The aluminum helps to dissipate heat much better than steel does. Um, but also like the the heads of the bolts in our covers are actually countersunk too. So when you get out into the rocks, you're not uh, going to chew up the head of those bolts on the diff covers. So that was kind of something cool we did. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's always aggravating when you go to get off that last bolt off your differential and the head's ground off from dragging across rocks, right? <laughs> Sounds like you've been there. <laughs> a time or two. <laughs> the main thing when you're changing a differential cover or just checking your fluid, like you said, if you see some drips and you're like, oh, I should probably check into that and you take that cover off, the main thing to know if you are the person who's a DIYer and this is your first time changing a diff cover or taking off your factory one, inspecting and replacing, is that that seal surface has to be clean. It has to be perfect. Um, and most of a factory diff cover is going to come with some kind of gasket maker, some kind of uh, silicone. So you pop that off and you scrape that with like, a flat razor and then you can take like a scotch bright and kind of uh clean it off and it, you can either replace it with some type of gasket maker or like a rubber gasket like a lube locker um for someone who's really new a lube locker is great because it's simple it goes it only goes on one way <laughs> once it's on there uh everything lines up and you bolt your cover back on a uh, gasket maker can be kind of messy and <laughs> i personally as a new jeep owner um, always felt kind of like, is there enough? Is there too much? Um, is it supposed to leak out like that? But the main thing, if you're a Jeep owner and you're at home and you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to take this cover off and I'm going to inspect my gears. Like the number one thing is just to get that surface clean on the housing and on the cover. And then also, um, be sure to make sure your bolts are nice and clean and there's no oil in the holes. There's no oil on the bolts. Um, and everything is nice and cleaned out. And a great way to clean out those bolt holes and clean the bolts is with some brake clean. Yeah, that's that's perfect. And when you tighten those bolts down, you don't just want to, you, you kind of want to do them like you would when you tighten the lug nuts on your vehicle, right? You want to work your like way around. Yeah, perfect. That way you kind of get them evenly torqued all the way around. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. So. Excellent. Well, we've got uh, a couple of good questions here. Um, before we go into the questions, what, el what, what other type of things would you guys like to share with us? There's a few things that I like to cover anytime I'm talking to someone who um, maybe is new to gearing or new to off-roading or jeeping. Uh, just because you can fit a 40-inch tire doesn't mean you should. <laughs> uh, just and, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't you shouldn't build your dreams. By all means, build your dreams. But uh, a lot of people want to do these big tires, but they don't want to do the things that come along with it. Um, a major one for me is gearing, obviously. And I hear this a lot. Uh, if it's 35s, you don't need to gear. And that's just not true. Um, anytime there is a change in tire size, there needs to be a corresponding change in gear ratio. So that's why a Jeep JK, a Sport comes with a, a 321, a Sahara comes with a 373, and a Rubicon comes with a 410. Well, the reason why is because all three of those trim models come with a different tire size. And so anytime you change your tire size, you're going to want to correspond the gear ratio. But also, just as important as gearing, um, those front axles are not meant to hold that big of a lever on the outside of the housing. Cause this is like a lever. It's like a big old lever that's out there just pushing on that housing. So you really want to go with our nitro sleeves 
So I have a really cool product that's made here in the USA. It's called, they're, they're these knurled axle sleeves. And knurled on the end just means you don't have to weld them in. You just pound them in and they're done. There's no welding required. So that is something that needs to be done prior to um, throwing on a, a really large tire. And then we also have some C gussets. Um, which gusset that big C that holds the wheel and tire on. And that there um, can, has a tendency to bend. So if you do these C gussets, you don't have the, the problem of that bending. And those are also another one of our nice American-made products made actually by a, a veteran company. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really good information right there because everybody wants to have that big tire, but they don't want to do the upgrades that come along with it. And then they're stranded on the trail, right? right so that's a big right. deal. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and actually, before we move on to that, one thing, um, and I learned the hard way about differential breathers, right? Um, you know, that's something that's very important to the differential because as the fluid kind of heats up and then cools down, expands and contracts and everything in there goes through its process. If your differential breather, like a lot of them come from the factory, gets plugged right at the differential, that can create some issues, right? Yeah, if your if your breather is plugged, it can actually cause axle seals to leak on you. Um, so I mean, yeah, the that's probably the biggest spot where it occurs is right at that thread end fitting. I mean, you wouldn't believe how many of them come just full of dirt and rust that you know on older vehicles. We have to actually have to take a drill bit and run down through them. But you know, it having something like that where your breather is actually causing your axle seals to leak we didn't even need to replace the axle seals we just had to make the differential vent again yeah 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 so do you guys offer things like um re differential breather relocation brackets and kits and things like that no we don't uh we don't really arb has a breather kit that we sell but other than other than that one kit from arb uh, a lot of times it's just a case of finding the right size hose that will fit on the barb. And then you can just take like a rubber lined clamp that you can get at AutoZone or anywhere and just run that breather up, run a circle in it, and then run it up higher on your fender well or in your engine bay, you know, even zip tie it to your roll bar or something. Just, you know, s somewhere where you know that I'm not going to go through water deeper than this level. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I know a a lot of, yeah, hopefully. I know a lot of people will relocate them like on the rear differentials up into like their taillight housing or something like that, um, yeah. which I, I've seen to be pretty good. I've seen the ARB kit with the little breathers on them, and those seem really nice. Yep. Yeah. Are, are those the little squishy ones? No, that's a trail gear product there. Excellent. Well, I've got a couple of good questions here. Um, the first one I've got, uh, someone actually asked uh, where your gears were made. Okay. Uh, well, ring and pinions are actually made in South Korea. Um, we, do, we do try and make as much as we can in America. Uh, differential covers, our sleeve kits, uh, our billet aluminum third member, our C gusset she mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't uh, there isn't really a gear manufacturer that can keep up with the volume of a company like ours um, and get you the gears at a price point that you're willing to pay. So, you know, after years and years of doing this and seeing factories in China and India and South Korea, uh, basically we've chosen the South Korean factory because they actually make gears for OEMs such as Kia and Hyundai it would be the two biggest ones that they make gears for. Yeah. Excellent. So um, then I've got a question from uh, Tom here. Uh, do you have or how do I find gears for a Jeep Wagoneer Dana 44 and a Zuzu Dana 44? <laughs> okay. We actually have gears for both of those. Um, boy, any ratio you want going from a 308 ratio all the way up to... Uh, 538s on both of those axles and most of those gears are available in a thin cut and a thick cut gear too excellent excellent oh and uh lockers as well lockers yes lockers for i mean any any axle out there not only so as far as traction devices go we've got lsds or 
pause attractions, right? Those can be clutch type. They can be worm gear type. And then you've got your mechanical lockers like your Detroit lockers. Nitro locker has a nitro lunchbox locker. And then also your selectable lockers, say your ARB, your Eat and E locker. We actually sell all these different brands. Awesome. Thank you for asking for that Zuzu and that Wagoneer. Well, yeah, it, there's there's probably 20 different options for those axles. Nitro owns yeah. a Wagoneer. We actually have a company, uh, Jeep Grand Wagoneer, that'll be unveiled at our SEMA booth this year. Um, That's it awesome. is probably going to be the most built Wagoneer in existence. Um, and so if anyone has any Wagoneer specific questions, we are your people. That is awesome. I always love those Jeep old Wagoneers. Hey, Jeremy. Yes, sir. You mentioned thin cut gears. I don't know what that means. <laughs> the the what? Thin cut uh, gears. Thin oh, cut. Yeah. Okay, so with the carrier, you've got what's called a deck. The deck is what the ring gear bolts onto. So let's just say that this deck here was a 373 and down. Well, then there's another deck on a Dana 44, which is a 391 and up, and it's taller. Now, obviously, it's not quite that tall, but let's just say about 5 sixteenths of an inch is the difference in the deck height. And so we offer a thick cut gear so that a guy does not have to purchase a new carrier, and it makes up that 5 sixteenths difference. Okay. I see so that. Like all okay. JKs are thick cut. All JK gears are a thick cut gear. But we have a we have established a kit where you can actually take a thick cut gear, which is a little bit stronger because it's thicker, and put it into an older style uh, Jeep. Like you can, we have a, a kit for a TJ where you can actually take a JK ring and pinion and put it in a TJ housing. Yep. Awesome. That is very cool. All right. Um, Cody Boone asked best flushing item for cleaning, um, brake carb cleaner, gas, etc., to finish flushing out the old diff fluid before reassembly. We use brake cleaner, um, just seems to clean the best and also evaporate quick. Um, you know, that's just, I, I would say that's the best one out of all that he mentioned there. Excellent. I, I agree with that. Um, brake cleaner probably does the best job. Yep. It does everything. That's right. Cleans, cleans your hands at the end of the day, too. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, guys. Don't go out and clean your hands with brake cleaner. I'm just joking. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, so um, I, that's the last of the questions we have. But uh, unless Al pops in and has something extra, I want to thank you guys for coming out. I learned a, a ton. Uh, from you guys and i believe everyone else has learned a ton too we see some really great comments in here um and actually we've got one more question popping up right here cody boone again um he's starting a 1975 jeep cj5 build if i keep the original engine trans i want a locker for the rear axle to help it out how to find one or source for info i would imagine your guys website or contact you guys for that right yeah, yeah. So it looks like he's actually, if I'm reading this right, a DJ5, like a postal one. Oh, yeah. The DJs yeah, were... would be a postal Jeep. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, have you done... I wonder if he's done a four-wheel drive conversion on it. <laughs> you could probably have a part number for a differential, what locker he needs anyway. Uh, yeah, if he wanted to, to lock up that rear axle, that because that's a Dana 44 under that DJ5. Uh, we've got a nitro lunchbox locker, which is just a part number LBD44, and that's a mechanical locker that uh, will lock both axles and, uh, you know, not going to break the bank. Awesome. Very cool. So, yeah, want to most definitely thank you guys for coming out, giving us your time this evening to to share with everyone your knowledge. Um, and I want to invite everyone that's in the chat. Um, to like, share, comment, um, tell your mom, dad, brother, sisters, dogs, hairdresser, you know, whoever, but share this video. It helps not only Southern out, but also we want to help Nitro out. So make sure you check them out on uh, social media, like their pages as well. And the next time you're in the market for um, some differential products or axle products, give Nitro a call. Thank, you, thank you for you guys having us on. Time. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Mike, I have a, Mike, I have a question for you. All right. So 
I think one of our major sponsors of the TechNet is BF Goodrich. Yes. What if what if you think they're giving away a set of tires through all oh. this TechNet series? Man, you're going to get me in trouble here, Al. I almost forgot. No, no. We're in this together. <laughs> so, yes, there is a chance to win a set of five BFG tires. How are they going to do that, Al? Well, what they're going to do is they're going to comment, I need a set of BFG tires. I flashed this up on the screen earlier, and I noticed a lot of people have already commented. Uh, what we'll do is this will get your name in the bucket. Yet again, if you've been, if you do it in EverTechNet, your name will go into the bucket every time. So if you've been on EverTechNet, you've got 11 chances to win. At Dixie Run, the first weekend of October, we're going to hold a drawing. And there will be one lucky winner of this set of five BFG tires uh, up to 37 inches. It can be KO2s or KM3s. You'll get a certificate, send it to BFG, and magically a set of five tires will show up on your doorstep or wherever you tell them to ship them to. Now, you don't have to be present at Dixie Run to win, correct? Not at all. We'll, uh, we, we understand that people are watching this tech net from all over the country, so you don't have to be present to win. Uh, we'll, we'll contact you and, uh, and ship you that certificate. And you'll have a set of beautiful BFG tires. I'll leave this open for a minute. Uh, Shanna and, and Jeremy, thank you so much. Uh, it was really informative. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much a novice at this, so I learned a lot by listening to you guys tonight. Uh, yeah. And I hope other people did too. Where, yeah, where is definitely. the Dixie Run going to take place at? Dixie Run is going to be, like I said, the first weekend of October at Wind Rock Park. Okay. Um, well, it's only about three hours from us, so we'll probably be there. Oh, we'd love for you to be there. We'll talk later about that, okay? Okay, yeah. sounds good. Speaking of yeah, that, awesome. speaking of that, guys, Dixie Run, the registration is going to open very soon. Uh, like I said, it's at Winrock. There's another way to get a chance to win these tires, too. Let me let me test Mike. What's the other chain, way to get a chance to win these tires, Mike? If you want another opportunity, another chance to get your name in the hat, make sure you go to www.sfwda.org and sign up as a member with Southern Four Wheel Drive Association, and that will enter your name again for a chance to win a set of five BFG tires. So, again, win-win, right? You become a member of Southern Four Wheel Drive, chance to win a set of tires. Do it. What are you waiting on? Why are you still here? Go do it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Thank guys you. so much. Bye now. Bye. Bye. -bye.